Oh, hey guys, Tyler here. Jurassic Park is one of the highest grossing films of all time. It's been praised by critics and audiences alike for its special effects, acting, musical score, directing, and more ever since its original 1993 theatrical release. The film features groundbreaking CGI by Industrial Light and Magic in the form of the dinosaurs that populate the park. It's these visual effects that paved the way for what we'd see in the Star Wars prequels, Steven Spielberg's AI artificial intelligence, Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy, and beyond. And it even inspired a new generation of paleontologists, creating a surge in discoveries about dinosaurs in real life. But does the science presented in the film, from the cloning process to the appearance of the dinosaurs themselves, actually hold any water? Let's find out. I'm certainly not the first YouTuber by a long shot to tackle the subject, but I've always found dinosaurs and paleontology in general quite fascinating. As I mentioned in my video about the various Zindi species from Star Trek, I actually wanted to become a paleontologist before I got into filmmaking. Now, you'd think that Jurassic Park is one of those films that would be a childhood favorite of mine, but the truth is, I didn't even see the film until I was in college. I was pursuing a film degree at the time, and. Hello? Oh, you're saying they don't give a shit about my personal anecdote, they just want to hear me talk about the dinosaurs. Oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Love you. Bye. Anyway, let's first establish some background about the film's plot. And, oh yeah, by the way, spoilers. In the film, which is based on a 1990 novel by Michael Crichton, an industrialist named John Hammond creates a theme park of cloned dinosaurs on Isla Nublar off the coast of Costa Rica. After a velociraptor kills a handler, not Chris Pratt, the park's investors demand experts visit the island to certify the park's safety. Among these folks are mathematician Dr. Ian Malcolm, played by Jeff Goldblum, paleontologist Dr. Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill, and paleobotanist Dr. Ellie Sattler, played by Laura Dern. The group learns that the cloning process is accomplished by extracting dinosaur DNA from the blood of prehistoric mosquitoes preserved in amber. Frog DNA is used to fill in the gaps in the genome of the dinosaurs, all made female by omitting testosterone during embryonic development. But Dr. Malcolm is concerned about the chaos that could arise from all of these extinct animals being brought to life in an enclosed space, saying the whole concept will inevitably break down. The group is joined by Hammond's grandchildren for a tour, but this doesn't go as planned. Most of the dinosaurs fail to appear, something a lot of us can probably relate to when we've gone to the zoo, and the group encounters a sick triceratops. In any event, the tour is cut short as a tropical cyclone approaches the island. Jurassic Park's computer programmer, Dennis Nedry, played by Wayne Knight, is bribed by an employee of Hammond's corporate rival to steal fertilized dinosaur embryos. Nedry then deactivates the park's security system, which cuts power to the tour vehicles and deactivates most of the park's electric fences as well. This allows a T-Rex to escape and attack the group, and Nedry is killed trying to reach the docks. Later, they find broken shells of dinosaur eggs, meaning that the dinosaurs have indeed been breeding as their frog DNA allowed them to change sex. The group retreats to an emergency bunker, but they soon realize that the remaining fences have failed, and now velociraptors are on the loose. Eventually, those who have survived this long restore the park's power, and the raptors are killed by the T-Rex, allowing the group to board a helicopter and get off this godforsaken island. That's, that's chaos there. Now, that's Jurassic Park. It's spawned numerous sequels, rides at Universal Studios, the works. But our question today is, is the science in Jurassic Park even remotely accurate? It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. Let's start with the whole cloning from dino DNA and the blood of ambered mosquitoes thing. 
You see, DNA only has a half-life of 521 years, meaning that every 521 years, half of its nucleotide bonds disintegrate. For this reason, it's only possible to recover usable DNA from the last 6.8 million years, and of course the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, went extinct 66 million years ago. Furthermore, today it's believed that most, if not all, dinosaurs were actually covered in feathers, much like modern birds birds, which are technically also dinosaurs because they're descended from the clade that included Archaeopteryx. These feathers likely functioned as thermal insulation, much like the down feathers of modern infant birds. This is also why it doesn't make too much sense to use frog DNA to fill in the gaps, as frogs are, well, amphibians. That said, the process of undergoing a sex change in a single-sex environment has actually been observed with some West African frogs, and it's even present in some fish species. Previously, it was believed that dinosaurs resembled modern lizards, and in fact, the word dinosaur itself, coined by paleontologist Richard Owen in 1842, comes from the Greek for fearsome lizard. Feathered dinosaurs also probably included T. rex, which had a top speed of 20 miles per hour, and velociraptors were closer in size to turkeys. That doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six-foot turkey. Much less imposing, though still slightly threatening. I mean, have you ever been attacked by a goose? As for the cloning itself, well, assuming that you have the requisite genetic material to work with, it is theoretically possible to bring back extinct animals. In addition to cloning, gene editing and selective breeding have also been considered. We've already applied some of these techniques to certain endangered species to increase their biodiversity, such as with the Pyrenean ibex. After the last ibex, Celia, was captured in Huesca, Spain in 1999, tissue was harvested from her ear. American biotech company American Cell Technology announced a year later that the Spanish government was allowing them to clone Celia. Celia died in 2000, ending the natural existence of her species, and indeed, the first few cloning attempts did fail. Finally, a clone was born alive in July 2003, though it died several minutes after birth due to defects in its lungs. The cloning process was achieved by extracting the nucleus from a preserved cell and swapping it into an egg without its nucleus from the extinct species' closest living relative. Celia is also not the only animal to be cloned. Famously, Dolly the sheep was cloned in 1996 and went on to live a relatively normal life until she died from health complications six years later. We could probably clone saber-toothed tigers or woolly mammoths if we really wanted to, but when it comes to dinosaurs, is cloning them even really possible? Do I even really need to answer this question? I mean, no, it's, it's not possible, at least to our best current understanding. Even if we tried editing the genes of modern birds to express certain primordial characteristics, they still wouldn't truly be a dinosaur, a non-avian dinosaur, because remember, birds are dinosaurs. Besides, if you have a genome that's incomplete, then by definition, it's next to impossible to know where to fill in the gaps, and again, you likely wouldn't do it using frog DNA. <laughs> Plus, the whole ethics surrounding this idea are so questionable that only a billionaire with way too much time on his hands could possibly think it's a good idea. There's no real practical reason to bring a dinosaur back to life, other than for entertainment value, which, let's face it, is not really that far off from enslaving animals to perform in circuses. And there's also the question of how they would fit into the broader ecosystem including what they'd eat. For instance, the plants that herbivorous dinosaurs ate have also been extinct for millions of years, and the concentration of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere has fallen 23% since the Cretaceous period, which would spell breathing problems for any extinct organism trying to survive in today's climate. So, sorry to be a downer, but there's just no way that we could create Jurassic Park. Or is there?
It's admittedly quite a stretch, but for decades, scientists have been conducting research into the field of so-called synthetic biology, including artificial cells. Because of recent advances in genetic engineering and lower costs, it's a rapidly growing field. In 2016, over 350 companies around the world were engaged in synthetic biology applications, all with a combined net worth of $3.9 billion. Some of the greatest milestones in synthetic biology so far have been the publication of artificial bacteria genomes. These include Mycoplasma Laboratorium, whose full genome was successfully synthesized and transplanted into another bacterial cell, whose DNA had been removed, and it was able to grow and replicate. That was 2010. In 2019, researchers reported the creation of a new artificial life form based on E. coli by encoding 20 new amino acids. Could this eventually be scaled up to a macroscopic organism, let alone one that's been extinct for tens of millions of years or hundreds of millions of years? Well, we're probably still decades away from such possibilities, and given the various ethical hurdles we discussed earlier, maybe that's for the best. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments. So, could we build Jurassic Park? Well, not with the methods prescribed by the books or the films. The closest we could probably come in the short to medium term is some form of augmented or virtual reality. And again, that's not too far off from a Universal Studios theme park ride. This video is not sponsored by Universal Studios, I just happen to keep mentioning them. Anyway, while Jurassic Park will likely remain in the realm of science fiction for years to come, it's still a really good film that changed filmmaking and paleontology forever. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you next time. And remember, life uh, finds a way.